Hi everyone, my name is Mac and I'm one of the instructors here at markmeldrum.com. I've been with the team for several years now, answering comments, teaching live sessions, and making video content. But in this video today, we're going to bridge the gap between what's taught in the material and how we can actually apply it. We'll be implementing some of the core concepts from portfolio management found in both the CFA level one and level two curriculum. We're going to be using Python and some real market data. So let's start with our imports. Each of these libraries here serves a specific purpose in our task today. NumPy gives us the mathematical functions we'll need. Pandas is our data manipulation tool. It allows us to put our data into tables and work with it in that format. Y Finance provides free access to Yahoo Finance data. That's what's gonna make our analysis uh, use real world data or allow us to tap into that real world market data. And then we have Matplotlib and Seaborn. These will help us to create professional visualizations so we can get a better sense of what we're doing here. And then you can see the assets we're using next under the variable tickers. So we have a mix of some large cap equities, Apple, Microsoft, JP Morgan, Johnson & Johnson. We also have an ETF, TLT, that is for the 20 year treasury. And we also have gold as a commodity. And then once we specify the tickers, we also have to specify our time frame. So our end date is going to be December 31st of 2019. And then our start date is just our end date minus our specific our set period, which is three years. So just 365 times three. And then we create the variable raw data. This is just pulling the data from Y Finance. So it's gonna download for the given tickers, all the data from the start date to the end date. And that's gonna give us our open, high, our close, our adjusted close, and our volume for all of those securities. And another important thing to mention is we have our close price and our adjusted close. For what we're doing here, we'll be using the adjusted close price. So if you look at this line here, it's data, and then our raw data will be the adjusted close. And if adjusted close doesn't exist, it will fall back on the close price. But the reason we use the adjusted close is because it accounts for dividends and stock splits. So if we were to use the regular close, it just wouldn't include that. And our calculations wouldn't make all that much sense. And then for our return calculation, just this variable right here, returns, it's just the percentage change function that we're gonna use um, this is straight from level one if we look at a holding period return. So we have the price uh, one period out from now minus the price today divided by the price today. And essentially that's just the percentage change. So we're using the percentage change function and we'll do that for every single day. So we'll have the, uh, the daily returns for each of these securities. And then you also see this drop function at the end of the returns variable. And that's just to drop the first row because that won't have a return because we'll be subtracting the return for the first day and that will just make the numerator zero and that won't make sense. So that's just to remove that first row of data. And then once we have all these daily returns, we can move forward to compute the arithmetic and geometric mean. So the arithmetic mean and the geometric mean, obviously we cover this in level one at the beginning of quant, but the arithmetic mean, just as a reminder, this is what most people intuitively calculate it's just the average um, of the returns and uh, we'll annualize that figure. So we're just going to take the sum of all the daily returns and we're going to divide it by the, uh, the count of the daily returns. And we can do that just using the mean function here. And then we multiply that by 252 to annualize it as there's approximately 252 trading days in a year. But we know we're not after the arithmetic mean. We're more interested in the geometric mean as it accounts for compounding. So just a little bit of arithmetic here and we'll be able to produce a geometric mean for all of these securities as well. And then below that, I just have a quick comparison here. It's gonna print out uh, when we run the, the script, the difference between the arithmetic and the geometric mean. But we're gonna be using the geometric mean obviously because it accounts for compounding and is more accurate for what we're doing here. And once we've calculated all our return measures, we can move forward to calculating our risk measures more specifically variance and standard deviation. So again, we have our functions here to do that. We have the variance and standard deviation function. So if you look here, the variable variance is just the variance of the daily returns, and that will give us our daily variance. And then we multiply it by 252 
to get the annualized figure. Standard deviation though, we multiply it by the square root of 252 just for the scaling. So that's how we get the annual standard deviation. And then once we've computed the returns and the risk measures, our next step is to analyze how these assets behave relative to each other, which brings us to correlation, a core concept in portfolio management. So we're gonna calculate the correlation matrix using pandas, the core function directly on the returns data frame. This gives us a matrix where each cell shows the strength and direction of a linear relationship between each asset pair, ranging from negative one to positive one. And then I visualize this matrix using Seaborn's heat map function to make the relationship a little more intuitive for us. And we'll see that when we run the code, you'll be able to see the heat map. And when we get there, you'll see that red indicates positive correlation and blue negative. But a key insight that we should know from the CFA curriculum is that correlation less than positive one creates diversification benefits. Even a correlation of 0.9 provides some risk reduction in cases. But that's just a callback to what we've learned in portfolio management in both levels one and two. Now moving into one of the more important calculations from portfolio management in level one, and that is for the two asset portfolio. It's a formula you absolutely must know. It's gonna come across a lot of practice questions, but we start by defining the weight for stocks and the weight of bonds. So for here, for stocks, we set it to 60%, and for bonds, the remaining weight, 40%. So our portfolio's expected return is simply the expected return on the stock portion multiplied by the weights. And then again, the expected return on the bond portion multiplied by the weights. So it's just a weighted average. But then when we move into the variance calculation for a two asset portfolio, it gets a little more complex. Nothing too crazy, we'll just walk through it right now. So the first term is just the weighted variance for stocks. So it's just the weight squared multiplied by the variance squared. And then our second term is the weighted variance of bonds. Again, the same thing, just with the variables applicable to bonds. And then our third term, it is the covariance term. So it's two multiplied by the weight of the first asset multiplied by the weight of the second asset multiplied by the correlation and the uh, standard deviations of both. So that third term is where diversification happens. If correlation is negative, this term reduces the total variance. So that's the most important part of this whole calculation is that third term. And then putting level one behind us, we move towards more of the level two material and that's the efficient frontier. So we're gonna use Monte Carlo simulation to find the efficient frontier. So we define the number of portfolios to be 10,000 and then the number of assets, that's just gonna count the number of tickers we have the weights, they're going to be random weights. So we're essentially, we're just generating 10,000 random weight combinations. Each row sums to one, so 100% invested. It's just a brute force approach to finding the efficient frontier. And then once we have all these portfolios, we'll compute the sharp ratio for every portfolio. The result is the efficient frontier plot, where each point represents a simulated portfolio. The upper boundary of this cloud forms the efficient frontier. And that's the set of optimal portfolios that offer the highest expected return for any given level of risk. I identify two special portfolios here. Uh, the first being the maximum sharp ratio portfolio. This offers the best risk adjusted return. These are the kind of portfolios professional managers optimize towards when constructing diversified portfolios for clients and institutions. And then finally, we're gonna create a comparison to look at four different strategies. The first being individual stocks with no diversification, then the classic 60-40 with a simple diversification. We'll also have the minimum risk, so the maximum diversification for safety, and then the maximum sharp ratio, so the optimal portfolio for risk-adjusted returns. So this bar chart will just show us the return and the risk side by side for each of these strategies, just to better visualize the results. So let's go ahead and run this now and see what the output is like. Okay, so we'll just scroll back to the top here. Let me get it all on the screen.
All right, so you can see our date range right at the top here. So we did from 2019, uh, the, the 30th of December to 2017, uh, January, it looks like. And then we have our expected annual returns. These are the geometric returns. We have each our securities here, Apple, Microsoft, JP Morgan, Johnson & Johnson, and then we have TLT and gold. And then we have our comparison. Like I mentioned, we have our arithmetic mean and our geometric mean, and then just the difference there. And then we have our annual risk. So our standard deviations for each of these assets, uh, Apple, Microsoft, you can see the standard deviation. Um, TLT looks a little higher than it, what it would historically be, but it could just be that time period that we chose. The, the volatility might have just been a little higher. But if we come down here, we have our heat map. So like I mentioned, red is positive correlation, blue is negative correlation. So we have Apple here, and if we go to the very top, we have Apple again. So the correlation between Apple and Apple is one. It's just a perfect positive correlation because it's the same. And then that's the same for each of these. Uh, going diagonal here. But if we look at uh, Apple and say gold, we see a negative correlation and then we should see the same with TLT. So yeah, it has a negative correlation with Apple and then gold and TLT, positive correlation, negative correlation with all the, uh, the individual stocks and again negative with Apple as well. So it's just interesting or it's easier to see it with this heat map. Um, but this is as expected. We, we should see uh, fixed income and commodities having a negative correlation with our stocks. And that allows us to gain a diversification benefit when adding these to a portfolio together. And then we have our two asset portfolio calculation that we did. So this was the 60-40 stock bond portfolio, the expected return of this portfolio, and the risk. And then our diversification benefit we had a reduction in risk. Then, like I mentioned, our efficient frontier. So these are just the individual securities. You can see these risk on the, uh, the X, -S X axis here, the standard deviation, and our expected return on the Y axis. So the individual securities have higher expected returns, but higher risk. We have our minimum, very minimum risk portfolio, which you can see here as the, the smallest amount of risk of all these portfolios. And then we have our maximum sharp ratio portfolio falls right out here. Just a nice way to visualize this. And then we come down our optimal portfolio weights. So this is for the, uh, the sharp ratio uh, portfolio. We can see Apple at 11.56%. Microsoft has the highest weighting at 57%. JP Morgan at 25%, Johnson & Johnson at a mere 3%, TLT at two, and then it doesn't look like gold made this one and our expected return at 32%, our risk at eight or 8.22% and our sharp ratio at 3.9. And then for the minimum, minimum risk, Apple's at 2.95, Microsoft got smaller, JP Morgan also got smaller and our allocation to gold got bigger. And then just to wrap this all up, we can visualize this. So our individual stocks, the expected return was 26.9% and the risk, our standard deviation was 20.7%. Then we have our different combinations here. So with our 60-40, our expected return dipped a little bit, but our risk um, reduced substantially. With our minimum risk portfolio, this is what we should expect is the lowest amount of risk and then our expected return would suffer a little bit. And then our optimal or our max sharp ratio portfolio has a lower risk than the individual stocks, but a higher expected return. So just a, a neat way to visualize all this. But that wraps up this video. I hope you found it helpful. It's just material that you'd see in both level one and level two of the CFA exam. And then again, my name is Max Wozki, just one of the instructors at markmeldrum.com. And thanks for watching.